Praise the Lord, you're with us. We're going to have a study, a continuing study here. Uh, I started the first uh, lesson on this, the Day of the Lord, three or four weeks ago. So I'm going to give you uh, part two of this, and I think you'll find it kind of exciting. So let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you for all you are, all you've done for us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the spirit that you've given us. Father, we thank you that we have freedom and that freedom is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I do bless this study. It might have meaning to folks. We'll thank you in Christ's name and amen. All right, let's turn over to John chapter number 5. John chapter number 5. This is the text I used uh, in the last study uh, to get us kicked off and uh, give us some understanding of what we want to talk about. So John chapter 5, that's the Gospel of John chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 19 down to 23. 19 down to 23. Here it says, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him." So that's where we are. We're looking at a relationship now between God the Father, as we would say, and His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the ministry of Christ, all right? And what it's predicated on. That's what we're actually looking at here this morning. So in review, let me turn my notes back a couple pages here so you'll understand what's, what's going on. I'll give you a little... Uh, update in case you, you forgot <laughs> about what we were looking at here. We were looking at uh, what we call number one when it comes to prophecy and what has happened and what God have, was doing and is still doing. We looked at the fact of His coming. We're talking about God the Father now in the Old Testament. The fact of His coming. And, uh, and with the fact of His coming we saw there was time and context of whatever event it was. And I'll give you an example of a, an event here in a minute. Then we looked at the language of the day of the Lord. The language. It's pretty, uh, it's metaphorical. All right? It's metaphorical, the language. And then the purpose of the coming of Yahweh. And the first illustration I gave you was out of Isaiah 13, verses 1 and 2. And it had to do with Babylon being destroyed by the Assyrians and the Medes uh, and Persians, all right? And that took place in, in, uh, uh, with the Assyrians in 689 B.C., and then with the Medes in 539 B.C. And so God calls it the day of the Lord. So it's a day of judgment. And, and that, that's a total fact, okay, that you see. A historical fact. It happened. It was the day of the Lord. The language was metaphorical or figurative, and we looked at... Um, uh, Daniel and Isaiah, and uh, for different things like we read about the moon being turned to blood and the mountains melting and those sort of things, you know, as, as being figurative because those things did not happen. But in the mind of the, the Jewish mind, they understood what that meant. All right, it meant that there, there's judgment, severe judgment coming here. And that's what it's all about. And then the purpose uh, has to do with God revealing himself as a sovereign of the world. So, uh, or I should say the universe. So let's do this today. Uh, let's look at the purpose of the coming of Yahweh. And what we're going to do is go back to the book of Ezekiel. All right, so if you want to find Ezekiel, please, right after Jeremiah and before... Uh, Lamentations and Daniel, right? Now, what I want to do is, is this, give you a little history here of, of Ezekiel and what's going on. Uh, the purpose of God in doing this, we call it the day of the Lord, and 
Many of the prophets use that term, and then it's used again in the New Testament, which we'll see in further studies here, okay? Is so that they might know that I am the Lord. That's why these things happened, okay? Now, uh, keep yourself here, because what we're going to see is this. So that they may know that I am the Lord. That appears 74 times in the book of Ezekiel. That's quite a few times, 74 times in the book of Ezekiel. But let me give you some history so you'll understand exactly what we're talking about here in connection with the day of the Lord. So keep your finger here and come back to 2 Kings. All right, 2 Kings, right after the Samuel books and right before Chronicles. 2 Kings, and we want to see chapter 24 and 25 here. All right, and let me give you a little history. Now, I, I have here a... Uh, what's called a New Inductive Study Bible, ESV. I've had it for a number of years. And it's interesting in that at the beginning of each book, it gives you questions that you need to find by yourself, all right? And it also has a lot of charts, gives dates, that sort of thing, to help you get the historical background of, of what's going on, all right? So we're in 2 Kings in chapter 24. 2 Kings 24. Now let me begin reading here. I'm not going to read both chapters, but just portions of it here to let you know what's happening. Because when we get to Ezekiel, Ezekiel is going to be giving us prophecies concerning Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians coming down. But yet, where was Ezekiel when he wrote? He was a captive in Babylon already. But yet he's going to talk about <laughs> Israel being destroyed. So you thought, well, that must have happened already, but watch. All right, so verse 1 of chapter 24. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Now we're talking about he came up to Jerusalem, okay? And the Lord sent, <clears throat> sent against him bands of the Chaldeans, and bands of the Syrians, and bands of the Moabites, and bands of the Ammonites, and sent them against Judah to destroy it. Now, who sent them? The Lord did. According to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servants, the prophets. Now, next to verse number three, if you have a pen or pencil, you should write 605 B.C., all right, 605 B.C. Surely this came upon... Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them out of his sight, to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all he had done, and also for the innocent blood that he had shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent uh, blood, and the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the deeds of Jehoiakim and all that he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. So what we find here is in 605 is when God sent these different groups of people that we read about in verse number 2 to Jerusalem to destroy it out of his sight, it says. All right, are you with me? Now watch what verse 7 says. This is kind of like a parenthesis. And the king of Egypt did not come again out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt, from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, <laughs> do you have enough fingers where you can keep your hand here and turn back to Ezekiel? And let's go to Ezekiel 29. <clears throat> I find this most fascinating. But I, chapter 29 of Ezekiel, but, keep, but you're, you still have 2 Kings 24 in your hands. All right? So are we all over there? Now let me pick it up in verse number 18, please. Verse 18. Son of man. Now that was a term used for Ezekiel, my God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his army labor hard against Tyre. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was rubbed bare. Yet neither he nor his army got anything from Tyre to pay for the labor that he had performed against her. 
So here's the Babylonians going against Tyre, which is that little island off the coast there of, of Israel, okay, in the Mediterranean Sea. And the, the turn made bald, every shoulder was rubbed. In fact, these men labored, all right? How did they labor? Does anybody know your history? They built a bridge over to the, the island so they could get there. All right. Now watch what it says in verse 19. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall carry it off its wealth and despoil it and plunder it, and it shall be the wages for his what? So they labored up there in Tyre and didn't get anything. So God gives to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon what? Egypt. And they plundered Egypt, and that's payment for whom? For the soldiers, for, for the army, okay? For the army. I, uh, verse 20, I have given him the land of Egypt as his payment for which he labored, because they worked for me, declares the Lord. So who was the army working for? They were working for the Lord. Okay, on that day I will cause a horn to spring up from the house of Israel and will open your lips among them. Then they will know that I am what? I am the Lord. Now you can continue reading this, all right? And uh, you get to chapter 30, verse number 3. For the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be... A day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. A sword shall come upon Egypt. So what happens is, is Ezekiel is continuing here with, with his, his prophecy concerning what's going to happen. On, and it's called the what? The day of the Lord is near. Now watch. Come on back with me to 2 Kings. Now we digress back there to give you a little understanding. All right. So what was the payment for the soldiers for battling in Tyre and not making anything? Egypt. And who gave it to him? God did. All right? God gave it to him. Now, when I get to verse number 8 in chapter 24 of 2 Corinthians, we want to put, I'm sorry, Kings. Uh, did I say Corinthians? Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> My mind's thinking ahead here. Um, next to verse 8, write 597 B.C. Okay, 597. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he be, uh, became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Nehustia, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, the city, and the city was besieged. Now it's the second time. All right, second time. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. So the king makes a trip from Babylon. And if you look, at, if you look on a map, okay, which you have most of your Bibles, you're going to find that Jerusalem and, and uh, Babylon were just about on the same latitude. Problem was, it was all desert in between and stuff. So they, they, they took the route up along the river Euphrates and, down, and, and came down from the north. All right. So Nebuchadnezzar, verse 11, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon. He surrendered himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign. So that makes him how old? He was 18 when he began. So 26 years old. And carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made as the Lord had foretold. He carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained except the poorest people in the land. Now, this is when... Ezekiel is taken up into the land. All right? This is one that happened, 597 B.C. Okay? 597. I'll, I'll give you a little more detail at, at the end of the message. Now, if we skip ahead, all right, to chapter 25, and you ought to read the rest of chapter 24, you see. Now, in chapter 25, 
And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege work around it. Now I find this interesting because who was left in the land? Only the poorest people. But evidently some, you know, things escalated and people were there again. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes, comes in the ninth year of his reign back down to Jerusalem. So the city was besieged till the eleventh year of King uh, Zedekiah, who's the king of Israel there, or king of Judah. So you want to put next to verse number 2, 586 B.C. Very important date, right? 586 B.C. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Remember, they were besieged by the Babylonian army here. Then a breach was made in the city, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can read that also. All right, so now you have some background of, uh, of when the prophecy that we're going to talk about took place. All right, so, so as um, Ezekiel was taken up there with the 10,000 captives in, in 597, uh, and then the prophecies are going to take place, and they're going to be fulfilled in 586 uh, B.C. So let's come on back then to the book of <coughs> Ezekiel, please, in chapter number 6. And what we're talking about here this morning, and I, I don't want to go too quickly, but we're, what we're talking about is w the purpose for the day of the Lord. And <coughs> what we're going to find, and this is what I want to show you ultimately, is this. That the purpose of the day of the Lord is so they would know who the Lord was. Whoever it was. Jerusalem, Babylon, the Ammonite. You'll, you'll see as, as we go on here. Uh, these different nations. It's not going to be any different in the New Testament. When we read about the day of the Lord, the purpose of it is so that they can know who the Lord is. John chapter 5, say, is very key in, in the thinking here. As the Lord saw the Father doing, that's what He's going to do. We already did the lesson on, as you see Him going up in Acts chapter 1, so you shall see Him what? Coming down. Who's going to see Him? Who was there when He went up? Believers. Every eye shall see Him. Every eye of whom? Believers. All right? And we'll talk about that in the, in the lessons to come. All right? So in chapter 6 then of Ezekiel, let's notice just a few verses here. So we... we, we uh, keep things going. Verse number 7 says this, And the slain shall fall in your midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord. The slain. We're talking about, remember, Nebuchadnezzar is coming back, right? 586. And you shall know that I am the Lord. You come down to verse number 10, And they shall know that I am the Lord. I have not said in vain that I would do this evil to them. Why did that happen? Notice verse number 8 and 9. Yet I will leave some of you alive when you, have, when you have among the nations some who escape the sword, and when you are scattered through the countries. Then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they are carried captive, how I have been broken over their whoring hearts that had departed from me, and over their eyes that, I, that go whoring after their idols. And they will be lonesome, loathsome in their own sight for the evils they have committed for all their abominations. That's why this is going to occur. The day the Lord has to do with judgment, see? They, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Notice verse number 13. All right? And you shall know that I am the Lord. Again, fill in the blanks. Take these home and read them. All right? Uh, verse 14, And I will stretch out my hand against them, and make the land desolate and waste in all their dwelling places from the wilderness of uh, Riblah. Then, I, then they will know that I am whom? I am the Lord. Okay? They will know that I am the Lord. Now, I have a note in my, my uh, margin here that says to go to Zephaniah, chapter number 1. Zephaniah, okay? Minor prophet, right? <clears throat> Zephaniah. And Zephaniah can be found right after Habakkuk, okay? So Zephaniah in chapter number 1, I believe, yes. Now watch what this is called. Now, for your information while you're turning over there... 
okay? Uh, Zephaniah prophesied approximately, let me look at the dates here, okay, 23, uh, 7 and... Uh, 7 and 20, what's 7 and 20? 30 years. He's 30 years prior to Ezekiel, which makes him about 20, uh, 22 or 23 years before Daniel. That's when uh, Zephaniah prophesies. Okay? Now, in chapter number 1, verse 7 says this, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is what? Near. It's near. And we're talking about 30 years here, okay? The day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on that day, uh, day of the Lord's sacrifice, watch what it says. I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, you keep reading all the way down, say. Verse 12 says, At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, The Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. This is part of the day of the Lord and, and the punishment, okay? And obviously the day of the Lord takes place more than in a 24-hour period. But the day is near. It's within 30 years. Now watch verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day. Now there's your definition. It's a day of wrath, a day of judgment, you see. And again, you can, you can read this. Um, well, let me finish 15, verse 15. A day of wrath is, is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blasts and battle cry against the fortified cities, against the lofty battlements. I will bring the distress upon mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung, neither their silver or gold, and he goes on with it, okay? It says all the, now this is interesting, verse 18, halfway through, in the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end. He will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, were all the inhabitants of the earth put to death? No, no. no. Metaphorical speech here. Day of judgment. And that's how we have to begin to see these sort of things. We have to quit thinking like Gentiles in 2021. And we have to think as the Jews thought, the Jewish people who received these words, thought back in that day and put it into that context instead of our own context. All right? Uh, which which we'll, we'll see as we go through here. All right? So come on back to Ezekiel. And let's go to chapter 7, please. So what we're talking about here, and Zephaniah is talking about, is the third visit of the Babylonians down to Jerusalem, you see, is what, what, what we're talking about, the 586 date that we, that we saw with Nebuchadnezzar in 2 Kings chapter 25. All right, so when we come to chapter number 7, and again, why are we doing this? <laughs> what was the purpose for God? So they will know who I am. You see? So verse 4 says this, And my eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity, but I will punish you for your ways while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know what? That I am the Lord. We come down to verse number 9. And my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will punish you according to your ways while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know what? That I am the Lord who strikes say, that I am the Lord. Let's turn over to verse number 27, I believe. Um, well, let's look at 19 first. All right, verse number 19. 
They cast their silver into the streets, and their gold is like an unclean thing. Their silver and gold are not able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of whom? The Lord. In other words, as these soldiers are coming, they're giving them their riches, trying to buy their way out of it. And it's not going to work because it's the day of the wrath of the Lord. All right. They cannot satisfy their hunger, nor fill their stomachs with it, for it was the stumbling block of their iniquity. And I come all the way down to 27. The king mourns, the prince is wrapped in despair, and the hands of the people of the land are paralyzed by terror. According to their way, I will do to them, and according to their judgment, I will judge them, and they shall know that I am whom? The Lord. They shall know I am the Lord. Now, we're talking about against Jerusalem here, okay, as we look at this. Come over to chapter, uh, chapter number 10, all right? <clears throat> In fact, uh, while you're going to 10, I'm going to read chapter 9, verse 6. It says, Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Where does Peter say judgment begins? Yeah, in the house of the Lord, say, in the house of the Lord. So they began with the elders who were before the house. The house is the temple there, okay? That's going to be destroyed, by the way, in this. Now, I come to chapter number 10, uh, maybe not chapter 10, chapter 11. I'm sorry, one more chapter. Chapter 11, and let's notice, please, verses 10 and 12, where it says this. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel. You shall not know, you shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in the midst of it. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Do you think the Lord wanted to know people to know who he was? I mean, he was in a, now think of this. He was in a covenant situation with these people. We start with Abraham, see, with the patriarchs, with David, with these, these covenants and that sort of thing. And what did the people do? They totally walked away from it. So God, what is God doing? We, we'd say in a modern terminology, God is cleaning house. See, he's cleaning house. And uh, as, as you look at this, Okay, then I come over to uh, chapter 12, please. Notice verse 15. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I disperse them among the nations and scatter them among the countries. But I will let a few of them escape from the sword, from famine and pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the nations where they go and may know that I am what? The Lord. So he's going to allow some to escape so they can go to places and say, hey, listen, we've been through it. And the reason we've been through it is because of the Lord. We know who he is now. He told us this was going to happen and it happened. Can be difficult. <laughs> okay. Can be difficult as, as you look at this. Um, let's come on down to verse. Let me keep reading. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Eat your bread with quaking, and drink water with trembling, and with anxiety. And say to the people of the land, Thus saith the Lord God concerning the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the land of Israel. They shall eat their bread with anxiety, and drink their water in dismay. In this way her land will be stripped of all its contents on account of the violence of all who dwell in it. And the inhabitants, inhabited cities shall be laid waste, and the land shall be Come a desolation, and you shall know that I am the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, what is this proverb that you have about the land of Israel saying, the days grow long and every vision comes to nothing? That's how the people thought. But what did we read in Zephaniah? What did we read here? The day of the Lord is what? Near. Well, they don't think it's coming. All right, they don't think it's coming. So watch, here's another time verse, down in verse 28 of chapter 12. Therefore say to them, thus saith the Lord God, none of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be performed, declares who? The Lord God. Not going to delay. 
I mean, 30 years in terms of generation is not a long time. That we said, that's from Zephaniah. But now we have Ezekiel speaking, say, and it's, it's only about seven years from the time he's taken up until Nebuchadnezzar goes back down to fulfill what we call, he calls, the day of the Lord. All right, does it make sense to you? I, I hope it does. Now, it's important as you, you see this. What's John 5 say? As the Lord saw the Father, he worked within the parameters of the Father. The Father thought, that's what he thought, et cetera, et cetera. As, as, as the Father did, that's what the Son did, okay? Uh, now, this is going to be big when we get into the New Testament here, all right? We have three main passages we'll, we'll look at and see that. And we in Christianity have totally denied it. To us, near is not near. Close is not close. At hand is not at hand. It's thousands and thousands of years. And you know why? Because we're all Pentecostals. What do you mean we're all Pentecostals? You want to see something. When in fact it already happened and it's recorded by numerous historians. But we deny that, see? So, because we, we, we have an idea of what God's kingdom is instead of reading the scripture about what king, his kingdom is. Okay, so let's come over to chapter number, uh, what did I say, 20? Okay. Uh, well, I'll tell you, back up to 16. <clears throat> We're in Ezekiel. Back up to, to chapter 16. Watch what it says in verse 44 and down to about 48. Behold, everyone who uses Proverbs will use this proverb about you. Like mother, like daughter. That's the proverb. You are the daughter of your mother who loathe her husband and her children. And you are the sister of your sisters who loathe their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father was an Amorite. And your elder sister is Samaria who lived with her daughters to the north of you. And your younger sister, sister who lived to the south of you is Sodom with her daughters. So what, what do we have here? We have a comparison of Israel between Samaria and Sodom, who when we see Sodom, we think that's a, that was the worst place ever in the whole world with the Sodomites and all that, and God destroyed his fire. But watch what it says. Not only did you walk in their ways, verse 47, and do according to their abominations, within a very little time, you were more corrupt than they in all your ways. As I live, declares the Lord, God, your, <laughs> the Lord God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Wow. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease. But they did not, they did not aid the poor and needy. And they were haughty and did abominations before me. So I remembered them when I saw it. And then he goes into what Samaria did. Okay, but watch verse 53. I will restore their fortune, both the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters, and will restore your own fortunes in their midst, that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all that you have done, becoming a consolation to them. As for your sisters, Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former state, and you and your daughters shall return to your former state. So there, there's going to be, there's a judgment that took place, but there's going to be a return, God says. Okay, so now we can go to chapter 20. All right, let's go over to chapter 20. And notice verses 33 through 39. 33 to 39. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand... And an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. And I will bring you out from the people and gather you out from the countries where you are scattered. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord, or declares God. I will make you pass under the 
rod and I will bring you in the bond of the covenant. I will purge out the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know what? You will know that I am the Lord. Okay. Let me ask you, uh, who was the king of Israel after Israel returned to the land after uh, Nehemiah and Ezra and Esther? Who was the king there? Yeah, so I think, think about that. Who was, the, who was the king prior to King Saul in the land? No, Saul, David, and Solomon. Who was the king prior to that? Who was to be the king? Who should have been the king? God was the king. But they wanted the king like all the other. God wanted to be the king. No king arose after they came back. God was the king. Okay? We call it the silent years or whatever. Come over to chapter 25. Now we're going to move away from Israel if we want to say Jerusalem. <clears throat> and we're going to see that God's, this day the Lord is going to include other nations. Um, let's notice 5 through 7. I will make Reha a pasture for camels and Ammon a fold for flocks. Then you will know that I am the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, because you have clapped your hands and stamped your feet and rejoiced with all the malice within your soul against the land of Israel, therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand against you and will hand you over as plunder to the nations. And I will cut off or cut you off from the peoples and will make you perish out of the countries. I will destroy you. Then you will know that I am what? the Lord. And then in verse 8 we see it's against Moab. Verse 9 against Moab. Verse 10 against the Ammonites. Verse 11 against Moab. Verse 13 against Edom. All right. Verse 14, I'll read this. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath, and they shall know my vengeance, declares the Lord. Okay, declares the Lord. When we keep reading, now the Philistines are also added to this. Thus saith the Lord God, in verse 15, because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy in never-ending enmity. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will cut off the Cherethites and destroy the rest of the seacoast. Then, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebuke. Then they will know what? When I lay my vengeance upon them for what they did to Israel. See, what they did to Israel. Now, come back to Ezekiel 28, please. Ezekiel 28, and I'm hurrying along here. Ezekiel 28. <clears throat> And let's notice, please, uh, verses 22, 23, and 24. Um, 21 says this, Son of man, set your face toward Zion, and prophesy against her, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Sidon. I will, I will manifest my glory in your midst, and they shall know that I am the Lord. When I execute judgment in her and manifest my holiness in her, for I will send pestilence into her and blood upon her into her streets, and the slain shall fall in her midst by the sword that is against her on every side, then they will know that I am whom? That I am the Lord. Now notice 25 and 26. Then saith the Lord God, when I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and manifest my holiness in them in the sight of the nations, then they shall dwell in their own land that I gave to my servant Jacob. And they shall dwell securely in it, and they shall build houses and plant vineyards, and they shall dwell securely when I execute judgment upon their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. And that happened when they came back down out of Babylon. Not all came back, but some, some did come back. All right? Page 2. Chapter 29 and 30. And I read some of this already. Um, and I'm not going to read it again. This has to do with uh, 
God giving Egypt over to uh, uh, the Babylonians as payment for their work. They worked for me, verse 20. Remember that? And in chapter 30, uh, verse 3, it's called, The Day of the Lord is Near. All right? Day of the Lord is Near. Now notice with me, please, verse 25. Verse 25. I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, but the arms of Pharaoh shall fall. They shall know that I am the Lord. Then I, or when I, put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he stretches it out against the land of Egypt. So 29 and 30 have to do with the prophecies against Egypt, which were payment to the Babylonians, all right, and to their soldiers. But notice that very, I will strengthen the arms of the king. Then they shall know that I am the Lord when I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon and stretch it out. So what was God doing here? This is the point that I, that I want to make. God never appeared physically to anybody on earth. And as you read the prophets and you read what, what goes on, you see the, 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 the metaphorical language that takes place about mountains melting and the earth shaking and all this sort of things and the things in the heavens, all right? It's all metaphorical. Talking about God's judgment coming upon these people. But he never appeared once. Who did appear? The nations he used against Jer Jerusalem, then Jerusalem against other nations. See, that's the language that you see here, that God used these armies of other nations to go in and do his work, see? And he even paid the Babylonians for it. A good wage, evidently, all right? And we don't think of those things, see, as, as, as we read these. So what we actually see, and we could go on. Remember, there's 74 times in the book of Ezekiel, then they will know that I am the Lord. The fact of his coming is historic, and the things that happened in the Old Testament here. All right, with the Babylonian, you know, we circle that because that's what we just looked at with Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. But Babylon itself was destroyed, we saw in the first thing, by the Assyrians and the Medes, which all, was all the work of God, see? And he used the armies of these other nations to do his work. That, that's what we're looking at. So the fact of his coming, this, this history with the time and context, you, you can't argue with it. It's there. It's historical, if you, if you please. So these armies were utilized by the sovereign God. They shall know that I am the Lord. Okay? So they invaded and destroyed other nations on behalf of whom? Yahweh. That's what the deal is. And what was the language that was used? The day of the Lord, we see, and the language that, that, that went with that was all metaphorical. It was figurative language. And that's what we have to see. Someone told me, well, Dan, you people just spiritualize everything. It's not spiritualizing at all. It's what those people understood when they heard, those Jews. Just because you and I can't understand it because we don't have the mind of uh, the Jewish mindset, see? That's why I ordered a Bible for $78 written by the 100 Jewish scholars of the Old Testament that gives many, many commentary. I can't wait to get it. But it doesn't, it, it, it's not coming out till June 20th. All right, so you get their mindset on it, see? Their mindset. That's what we're looking for when we're in the Old Testament, okay? And even in the New Testament. So the language is metaphorical. The purpose, he came to judge or to vindicate. Both of them he did, okay? To be glorified and to be revealed as the one true God. And so what did God do? He utilized the armies of nations, whether to judge or vindicate. Okay? That's what he did. And that's what we're talking about, the day of the Lord. So the, finally, the, as we see this, the purpose of Jehovah's Perusia, okay? And that's the word that the uh, uh, translators of the uh, Septuagint used, the Old Testament. They took it and turned it into Greek when they talked about coming. Okay? Uh, they used the word Perusia, which is a word that we see you know, about, about the, the presence of the Lord, okay? Uh, it's clearly presented. He came either in judgment or vindication to be glorified and to be revealed as the one true God. 
So what occurred in these comings of Yahweh is called a, a theophany. And we've heard this also. A manifestation of God's sovereignty in historical events. A theophany was an event in which the Lord revealed his power and identity. Now, the Anchor Bible Dictionary says this. God may be described in a form of a thunderstorm, unleashing lightning, hail, and torrents of rain, and at the same time as a warrior riding a chariot and leading heavenly armies into battle. That's how he can be described. Uh, see if you can find Habakkuk. Okay? It's right back there with Zephaniah. <laughs> okay? Come on back there. Let me read just uh, chapter 1 there, okay? Part of chapter 1. Habakkuk. Here we are. Three little chapters. Okay. And, and let's look at, uh, let's see, what verses do I want to look at? 3 through 15. And we want to look at chapter 3, although chapter 1, uh, I'll tell you, go, go to chapter 1. Let me start there. Chapter 1, verse 5. This is God speaking. Now, this is God speaking. Look among the nations and see and wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Now, when did Habakkuk prophesy? That's very important. Okay? He prophesied about 20 years before Ezekiel. Okay? For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize the dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and a fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than ev the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. Have you seen a horse fly lately? They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Come to chapter 3, please. Chapter 3. And let me begin in verse number 3. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like uh, the light. Rays flashed from his hands, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His, his were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushion in the affliction, and curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers, or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation, when you rode on your horses, who rode? God rode? The armies that God sent rode, right? You stripped and sheathed from your bow, calling many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed, and rage, the raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hand on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows they sped. At the flash of your glittering uh, spear. What, ha what would have happened to the earth if the sun and moon would have stood still? It would have been no longer. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out from the salvation of your people for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. Say law, it says. Say law. Think about it. You, you pierced with your own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surge of mighty waters. Say, what are you saying here, Brother Dan? <laughs> I'm saying this, okay, as, as you read this, we have to think as the Jews thought, this is metaphorical, the historical events occurred, 
The language concerning it was metaphorical, so these Jews would understand what was, what was going on, okay? Totally. But what was the purpose of it all? So that they would know who the Lord was. Not just Jerusalem and Israel, but all the nations around, including Babylon and the Egyptians, as you read this. It's very important. Now you might say, well, this, this is boring stuff. I don't like this. Well, wait till we get into the New Testament. Uh, let me just give you a little thing. Uh, you've heard me quote out of Kittle's Theological Dictionary. Kittle's is a, a, I think it's five volumes. The way I think is because I gave them to my son Dan. <laughs> okay, I had them. But, you know, they take up about yay much space on, on your, uh, uh, in your library. And uh, it has every word that's used in the New Testament in the Greek. And it explains it thoroughly, by the way, thoroughly. But Kittle's Dictionary says this concerning the day of the Lord and, and uh, the parousia. The hope of an imminent coming of the exalted Lord in the messianic glory is so much to the fore that in the New Testament the terms are never used for the coming of Christ in the flesh. And parousia never has the sense of return. This is what we're going to look at. Okay? Now, the folks that put Kittles together, Mr. Kittle, German, Miss Rose, okay, they weren't, future, they, they weren't fulfillment people. In other words, they believed in the future coming, okay? But yet this statement has got to make you stop and think. Never come in the flesh. Perusia doesn't have to do with that, okay, in sense of return. So we're going to look at that in our next study or begin to look at that, and we'll have a good time with that. So let's close right now, and we'll prepare for Brother Jim Johnson.